Good morning. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this morning and joining us for this exciting event. Um, would like to thank our speakers, the researchers that are going to speak today, to take time. They, they've taken time out of their extremely busy schedules to be here, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. I would like to thank our sponsors um, who are listed up here. Without our sponsors, we are unable to provide these symposiums for free to the public, so thanks to all of them. I'd especially like to thank the Steinberg Family Foundation. They are our presenting sponsor today. We have some elected officials here. would like to thank them for taking time to come out and show their support uh, for medical research. Uh, we have State Senator Scott Sifton back here. <laughs> um, and State Senator Jill Shoup right here. <laughs> And Senator Shoup, I believe we're in your district, yes, aren't we? we? Yes, we are. <laughs> so um, I see a lot of familiar faces, and I, I want to thank our longtime ongoing supporters. But I also see a lot of new faces. So I wanted to take just a moment to talk a little bit about Missouri Cures, who we are, and what we do. Um, back in 2006, Missouri Cures ran and passed the Stem Cell Amendment campaign. Now all research that's legal on the federal level is also legal here in the state of Missouri, including stem cell research. Uh, we were able to pass the amendment thanks to the physicians, researchers, patient advocates, faith leaders, business leaders, all who came together because they care deeply about finding cures and therapies for devastating diseases. So now Missouri Cures, we have two organizations. We have our 501c4, which is Missouri Cures, and that is our advocacy arm. And through our advocacy effort, we work with policymakers to educate them, um, to let them know the importance of medical research in our state. And Missouri Cures opposes any legislation that attempts to threaten medical research treatments and cures. And then in 2011, we formed our 501c3, which is our nonprofit arm. And that is the Missouri Cures Education Foundation. And it's through the foundation that we provide these great symposiums and these great education events um, that are free and open to the public. We promote researchers and the great medical research taking place in the state through our 501c3. We do that by our monthly e-newsletter. We also do that on our website, missouricures.org. We have an amazing outreach effort headed up by Margaret Tollerton. Margaret's right there in the back. <laughs> And uh, Margaret travels the state speaking to all types of civic groups and talking about what's going on at Washington University or what's going on at the Stowers Institute. So Margaret does a, an amazing job doing that. So Missouri Cures is the only organization that is solely dedicated to promoting and protecting medical research in Missouri. So we have a great program for you today. Uh, we have three sessions. We have cutting edge research, breakthroughs in blood diseases, and viruses treating cancer. Uh, we're going to have two of the sessions, and then around 10.30, we're gonna take a short break. You can grab another cup of coffee or another you know, uh, cinnamon roll. Um, and then we'll come back around 1040, and we'll have our last session. And then the symposium will wrap up around 1130. So um, I am not going to read the bios when I introduce the speakers. They are also very accomplished. But in your program that you have, it um, talks about um, all the, the speakers that we have today. And really the exciting thing about that is we have these great speakers right here, these researchers right here in our state at our great research institutions. You were also given some blank cards when you walked in, so if you have questions for the speakers, please write your question down, and then Margaret, um, and we'll have someone else on this side who will be walking along 
to collect the cards um, during our Q&A session. So our first session, let's get started, is Cutting Edge Research, and our first speaker is Dr. Kim Bland, Head of Science Communications for the Stowers Institute of Medical Research in Biomed Valley Discoveries out of Kansas City. Dr. Bland? Uh, thanks very much, Dina. Good morning. I am delighted to be here to be able to um, have the opportunity to come to St. Louis and to share some of our research with you. So my story today begins back in Kansas City with uh, Jim and Virginia Stowers and two research organizations that they established. The Stowers Institute for Medical Research, which opened its doors in 2000 and Biomed Valley Discoveries, which started operations in 2007. And um, what Mr. and Mrs. Stowers wanted to do in establishing these organizations was to use their accumulated wealth to uh, give back something to the numerous people who had helped them along their journey to financial success um, through Mr. Stowers' company, American Century Investments, and also give back to people who helped them through their personal bouts with cancer. And the way they sought to do this was to fund biomedical research, which they were convinced would someday lead to new therapies and, um, and potential cures for fighting disease and improving human health. So if we look at the, uh, the research spectrum, work at the Stowers Institute focuses at this end on basic research. So scientists study fundamental biological processes and what goes wrong, what, what goes wrong in those processes in certain illnesses and disease. Biomed Valley Discoveries takes discoveries from the Stowers Institute and as part of translational research, um, evaluates those discoveries and advances the most promising ones into further development and um, clinical testing. So in addition to discoveries from the Stowers Institute, Biomed Valley Discoveries also looks at findings and technologies from other labs and institutes. And the story that I'm gonna tell you about today actually um, involves a technology that originated at Johns Hopkins that Biomed Valley Discoveries has licensed and developed and moved into clinical testing. And now we're seeing some exciting clinical results from this program. So to get to the heart of my talk um, rather quickly, I'm gonna use just a single slide for background here. The main point being that medicine has made a lot of progress in the last century um, fighting disease and improving human health. So one thing that we can look at is infections, for instance, we can see that the death rate of infections um, such as uh, pneumonia, influenza, and tuberculosis has greatly decreased over the last about 100 years. However, if we look at cancer, cancer still remains a big challenge. If we look at the death rate of cancer over the same time period, it has actually increased. And one reason for this, of course, is because now people um, are, uh, uh, are not dying so frequently from things like infections. Um, but another reason is, as we all know, that cancer is just a very <coughs> difficult disease to treat. Um, and one aspect of cancer treatment that's difficult is uh, the eradication of solid tumors. So if we briefly look at tumor biology here, we have a tumor that is beginning to grow and it has a blood supply that provides oxygen and nutrients to the tumor cells. As the tumor grows, the tumor cells um, outpace the blood supply. The blood supply becomes disorganized and has a hard time reaching the core of the tumor. And it's this core region that becomes depleted in oxygen and nutrients, and it forms a hypoxic center. And as the tumor increases in size, this hypo hypoxic center grows as well. And some standard um, anti-cancer therapies have a difficult time uh, with reaching the um, the inside of these solid tumors, 
blood, uh, these therapies require a blood supply for either delivering the delivery of the agent, such as in um, chemotherapy treatments, or um, the availability of oxygen, which allows other treatments like radiation to be effective in this region. So researchers are looking for approaches to treat these hypoxic centers of solid tumors. And the approach that Biomed Valley Discoveries is um, looking at involves a, an anaerobic bacterium called Clostridium novi, or C. novi for short. Um, C. novi being an anaerobic bacterium, it thrives in low oxygen environments, just like those environments found at the center of solid tumors. In this image, you can see two forms of C. novi. The round shapes are the spores of the bacterium. These are the, the, this is the dormant form of the bacteria. And the rod-shaped um, bacteria are the vegetative state. So these are the uh, actively growing cells. And it's the, the actively growing form that is very sensitive to oxygen. So this slide shows the treatment procedure. In this example, we have a cell that has mutated and is forming a tumor in the shoulder area of this illustrated person. The tumor is growing, and we can see it by the purple shading here the hypoxic core of the tumor. As the tumor grows, that hypoxic core enlarges. And the treatment consists of injection of C. novi spores into the center of the tumor here. Once the spores are in the center in this low oxygen environment, they wake up, they germinate, they start replicating, and they start um, killing neighboring tumor cells. So they kill neighboring tumor cells and they consume the debris of the killed cells. And as they do this, they essentially start hollowing out the tumor. And they continue this activity until they reach the outer, um, the outer portion of the tumor, which is better oxygenated. It's that oxygen that stops their activity. And as I mentioned before, there are some existing um, therapies that are pretty effective at um, dealing with the outer tissue of the tumor. So we see that C. novi, we think that C. novi may be a good complementary therapy to some existing um, cancer therapies. But what about C. novi? Um, what are the risks of using a bacterium in this way for a treatment? C. novi is a naturally occurring bacterium in the soil, and it can be very dangerous. For instance, if C. novi penetrates a wound, it could lead to a very dangerous infection. Um, a lot of necrotic tissue damage, and possibly even gas gangrene. So C. novi from the soil submits toxins that are very hard to control and can lead to this widespread tissue damage. And I should also note at this time that using bacteria to treat um, or to, to fight tumors is uh, generally is not a new idea at all. In fact, even over the last half century, researchers have looked at a variety of anaerobic bacteria uh, to work in this way. A lot of these studies, however, have been hindered due to issues of toxicity. So in an attempt to find a safer bacteria to use to fight tumors, researchers in Bert Vogelstein's group at Johns Hopkins were able to essentially tame this wild C. novi to make a weakened strain of it. And they did this by removing a key toxic, toxin gene um, from C. novi, alpha toxin. They named this um, new strain C. novi NT. And so without this toxin, it's unable to um, create that widespread necrotic tissue damage that I mentioned. So this characteristic of C. novi NT plus um, its ability to stop growing after destroying the tumor core, as shown in a previous slide, and then also as a fail-safe, its response to antibiotics um, make it a, a better candidate for uh, a tumor-fighting agent. So the Hopkins group studied C. novi NT in a variety of um, uh, mouse and rabbit tumor models. And I'm not going to go over all of the data, but I wanted to show you just one example of an outcome. Um, they also looked at C. novi NT treatment in combination with some existing cancer therapies. 
And in this particular study, they looked at a, a mouse tumor transplant model. Um, they, for one mouse here with a uh, transplanted tumor, they uh, gave a course of radiation once per day for five days, starting at day zero. And you can see at day 10 that there was little to no improvement in the tumor. However, another mouse with a tumor received the same course of radiation and also received CNOVI treatment at day three. And you can see at day 10, there was a great reduction in the tumor. And so essentially what was the equivalent of a basketball-sized tumor in this mouse was reduced to essentially nothing. So these studies um, uh, and other studies created some interest in the early 2000s about CNOVI NT. However, no one stepped forward to develop it further or take it into the clinic. Um, and probably due to the, um, you know, how uh, risky or how radical of a, of a human clinical trial would be considered using this bacteria. But in 2010, Biomed Valley Discoveries picked it up. And you know, that realizing the, the riskiness of a human trial, they decided to first look at Synovi NT in companion dogs as um, a series of bridging studies. So companion dogs, these are pet dogs who have spontaneously occurring cancer, naturally occurring tumors, and were treated with Synovi NT in veterinary clinics and hospitals across the country. They're very well monitored and um, very well cared for. And I'd like to show you the results from one particular dog. This was Andy. He was a 12-year-old Maltese. He had an inoperable tumor near one of his ears. And you can see that here in this baseline photo. Um, the, the tumor was giving him a lot of problems, and um, uh, his outlook was not good. So Synovi NT was injected directly into the tumor. And at day two, you can see some, after treatment, you can see some activity here. It looks like the bacteria have found a, hy a hypoxic region, have started growing and consuming the tumor. By day three, the tumor had formed an abscess and had ruptured. And if we look out a little further, at day 14, uh, there's little tumor mass left. And also at day 21, it looks like it's healing quite nicely. I can also show you CT scans for Andy. This is a frontal view of Andy's face. His eyes are here, his snout is here. And you can see the round tumor in the baseline photo. And then at day 10, a great reduction in the tumor mass. So for Andy, his, his tumor never, um, was never fully destroyed, but it did stop growing, and he was able to live another 600 days after treatment um, and died of another cause. And if we think about that 600 days in human years, that's a pretty good extension of life and um, improvement for Andy's quality of life as well. So Biomed Valley Discoveries um, uh, treated about 150 dogs. And once they had that experience, they felt comfortable moving into the clinic and they, and, um, for human clinical trials. And they treated their first patient, who I'd also like to tell you about. So the first patient, um, a 53-year-old woman with leiomyosarcoma, which is a smooth tissue cancer. Um, that cancer had actually spread throughout her body. She had many tumors, and the one giving her the most problem was located in one of her shoulders. She had been a very athletic person, but um, because of this tumor, she was no longer able to move her arm, and she was experiencing a lot of pain. And she was facing a complete disarticulation or removal of the shoulder. So she very courageously um, agreed to be the first person injected with um, Synovi NT. The bacterium was injected into her um, shoulder tumor at MD Anderson. And very soon after injection, um, she developed a fever. There was some swelling at the injection, sh injection site, and she started experiencing a lot of pain. However, after four days, there was, um, a significant, there was evidence of a significant reduction in her tumor. And I'd like to show you her MRIs here. So in these MRI scans, tumor tissue shows up as white. We can see in the pretreatment image that there is a large tumor mass in her shoulder. But four days after treatment, um, a large amount of that mass has gone away. And at 29 days after treatment, there is very little left. 
So she was able to regain the use of her arm. She was able to move it freely, and she no longer had um, pain in that area after this time. I can also show you some images, some biopsy images for her, where there was evidence of cancer cells um, in, the in the tissue pretreatment, but no evidence of live can cancer cells after the treatment. Um, she went on to, um, to have uh, use of her arm for about six months after treatment, when then, unfortunately, she succumbed to the other tumors in her body that were not treated. And so I'd like to um, pause for a moment here and mention that these were the last images that Dr. David Chow, who heads up the Stowers Institute and Biomed Valley Discoveries, was able to show Jim Stowers before he passed away last year. And so Jim was able to see the, um, you know, that the vision that he and Mrs. Stowers had set forth was finally becoming realized. And this um, was very important to him, for him to see that work that um, came from a company that he had established um, was having a real impact. So where are we today with CNOVI? Uh, CNOVI NT is in phase one human clinical trials at eight sites across the country. There is a scalable manufacturing process in place because it's a bacteria, it's very easy to grow and prepare in a fermenter. And also Biomed Valley Discoveries continues to collaborate with the Hopkins group uh, to develop the next generation C. novies, um, which may be more potent or have other favorable characteristics compared to C. novi NT. So um, we have many more years of clinical trials uh, before us, but we think that CNOVI NT would, uh, could be a very um, good addition to the set of tools that we have for fighting cancer. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to share this research, and I look forward to listening to the other presenters today. Thanks. Um, session two, we have breakthroughs in blood diseases, and um, we have a wonderful speaker with an amazing story. Dr. Lucas Wartman is the assistant professor of oncology at Washington University School of Medicine. He's also the assistant director for cancer genomics at the Genome Institute at Washington University. Dr. Wartman? Thanks, Dina, um, and good morning, and, and thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to tell a story, and it's really my story, and I've got a lot of information on the slides for those of you who are interested um, in more of the details, but I just kind of want to paint a broader picture, so you can, you can look at the slides and you can ask me questions later. I'm happy to, to answer any questions about my story, so, um, but we'll, we'll go through this. What I want to first uh, talk about is really what, what happened with me and my own cancer diagnosis and treatment and how being at WashU was really instrumental in, in uh, what I consider saving my life. And then trying to turn that example into something more that we can build off of in terms of changing the way that we practice medicine. So let me tell you a little bit about the disease that I have. It's called acute lymphoblastic leukemia or ALL. It's the most uh, common childhood um, cause of, of death by cancer, um, but it's, it's still relatively uncommon. Only about 6,000 cases or so are diagnosed in this country uh, per year, mostly in children. Um, and it's, as many of you probably are aware, it's really the success story of oncology in terms of, of treating children with ALL, where now cure rates are about 90% of all uh, pediatric patients with ALL are cured of their disease. So it's really a remarkable advancement that's uh, happened just over the past 50 years or so. Unfortunately, the treatment for adults with ALL lags behind that of children for a variety of different reasons. And so the cure rates, even with the most modern regimens for adults, are only about 40%. I think that's changing for a lot of reasons, so there's uh, room to be optimistic here but it's still a bad, bad type of leukemia to get. 
And what's worse is that if adults relapse, their outcomes are very, very poor. So even after just relapsing one time, the overall survival drops then from 40 down to about 5%. So it's, it's not, a, not a good leukemia to, to get, if any are. Um, I was first diagnosed with ALL when I was a fourth year medical uh, student at Washington University. I was previously healthy. I had no health problems. I didn't have a physician. The last doctor I saw was my pediatrician. Um, started feeling sick, run down, night sweats, bone pain, fevers, these types of uh, things. Went to an urgent care clinic where they drew some routine blood work and found that my blood counts were low. Um, and I immediately then saw a specialist at WashU and, and, and started treatment right away. I was treated with traditional chemotherapy um, based on a collaborative group trial that started accruing patients in 1988. So I was diagnosed in 2003, um, and, but was still being treated off of a trial that uh, started uh, in 1988. So you can see that there's a bit of a disconnect uh, between what we would consider modern therapy and, and, and how I was treated. Nonetheless, this was the best that we had at the time. Um, many of you might be aware that uh, pediatric patients in general, almost all of them with cancer, are treated in a, on an active clinical protocol, whereas only about 5% of adults, it's probably closer to 3% of adults with cancer, are treated on clinical trials. So that's a major problem in this country is trying to uh, get more adults into uh, participate into clinical trials. It's, it's really the way we move uh, forward in terms of uh, treating cancer in particular. Nonetheless, uh, as you can see, I would have fit into this top um, curve. Uh, I was less than 30 at the time of my diagnosis, and so we thought that my chance of having a good outcome was, 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 was pretty good. Um, but unfortunately, five years later, so a relatively long time, kind of thought that I was out of the woods. I did relapse at that time. I was treated with very aggressive chemotherapy again and had a, a very, very aggressive um, bone marrow transplant. Uh, luckily, my younger brother was a matched sibling and so had the opportunity to, to get bone marrow from my brother. And that transplant was very rough to get through because of the toxicities associated with the conditioning regimen prior to the transplant itself. But nonetheless, uh, I recovered, I was in remission, and over about uh, the next year or so, um, really kind of uh, came back to almost being completely healthy. So, um, and for those select patients that do, are able to go forward and get a transplant, and WashU is one of the leading transplant centers in the world, we're the sixth largest transplant center in the world. Um, we did about 450 stem cell transplants last year. Uh, for those select patients who can get back into remission and can get a transplant, you can see here by this top curve uh, that they also have a pretty good outcome. So we thought that even though I had a relapse, that this was just going to be a hurdle that I had to overcome and that I would still be able to, to be cured and go on with my life. Of course, there's more to the story or I wouldn't be up here. Um, three years later, I relapsed again. Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in no man's land. So there aren't many patients that relapse with AL Health for the second time. Uh, this is just an example of uh, this is my actual um, leukemia cells from a, on my bone marrow biopsy at relapse. Um, what bone marrow uh, biopsies normally look like, we kind of describe as a uh, starry sky appearance where there's lots of blues and purples and different colors that represent the different cell types that populate a normal, healthy bone marrow. But what you can see here uh, is just really a monotonous sheet of cells, and that's because these are all leukemic cells that have now uh, replaced my normal bone marrow. So what did we do? I went on to a clinical trial, actually, at WashU, where um, we tried to use conventional chemotherapy along with a, a new agent to try to mobilize my leukemia cells out of the bone marrow and make them more sensitive to the chemotherapy. Um, it was really, really toxic because this, by this point I had had a lot of chemotherapy and radiation and all of these other things, so I didn't tolerate it as well as I had tolerated my prior treatment. And most importantly, it didn't work. It didn't put the leukemia into remission. So now I was left um, really struggling because um, I had relapsed refractory disease and um, could no longer tolerate really strong chemotherapy 
and it was unlikely that that type of strong chemotherapy was going to work at all. So what did we do? We tried to do uh, sequencing, and that's the story that I'm going to tell today. And so I had actually been working with Dr. Tim Lay at Washington University and, and his colleagues at uh, the Genome Institute, Rick Wilson and Elaine Martis, who had sequenced the first cancer genome uh, in a patient with acute myeloid leukemia, a related disease, and reported those results in 2008. And we've been very active at the Genome Institute uh, really since the uh, inception of the Human Genome Project over a decade ago. So all of this work kind of builds off of, of really that foundation, which was a huge, immense uh, project that was uh, federally funded. So as part of Tim's lab, and I was actually studying mouse models and doing the genomics of mouse models of, of cancer, um, but I was involved with the, with the human studies uh, as well. And just at the time of my uh, relapse, we had opened a, a research protocol that would allow patients with my type of leukemia, ALL, uh, to be sequenced. And no patients with ALL, adult ALL, had ever been sequenced before. And we had only at the time sequenced a handful of patients with acute myeloid leukemia. And so why did I agree to do this and what kind of what was my motivation for doing this was really uh, driven out of the idea that this was going to benefit the research community. And as I described earlier, there's this big difference between the outcomes between pediatric patients with ALL and adult patients with ALL. And my idea was that the difference between these outcomes was probably linked to differences in the genomics of the leukemia. So that there are probably different mutations driving adult ALL that made it less sensitive to the therapy that we use so successfully in children. But no one had been able to definitively show, you know, to, to prove that. But with these new genomic technologies, I thought that this would be a good start. And so that's what, really, uh, what I was hoping to do. I really didn't expect this to benefit me directly because, uh, as I said, this uh, started when I you know, right before I started this very aggressive treatment that didn't work. But at the time, I thought that aggressive treatment was going to work. So um, really wasn't planning on relying on the sequencing results. But uh, obviously, there's more to that story, too. Um, so before I get into to, to kind of particulars, I do want to mention just what, what they did. And what we did is what we call comprehensive genomic sequencing. And you hear a lot of these terms being thrown around, and there's a lot of different sequencing um, platforms that we can use. And, and why do we do this is because we're trying to understand kind of what's driving the disease on as many levels as we can. And so ultimately, there's changes in protein function that are driving the, the leukemia. And we can use these genomic uh, markers as kind of surrogates to try to identify those at the end. And two methods that we use are called whole genome sequencing, which can identify mutations in genes or mutations in uh, parts of DNA that control gene regulation, turning on or off genes. And then on top of that, genes can also be regulated through different ways, not by changes in the sequence per se but by changes in uh, chemical mod modifications to that sequence that also control their expression. And we can determine their expression by using, uh, uh, measuring essentially the amount of RNA present, which is an intermediate between the DNA on our chromosomes and the protein that, that forms in all of our, that makes up all of our cells. And so we try to harness these different technologies to really bring the most power to, to, to try and find uh, the answer. And so. Um, right now, there's a, a wide variety of these different platforms, and, and what you probably hear about if, if, um, if any of you know someone with cancer or who's had some genetic testing done lately is really what I have highlighted here, which is called gene panel testing. And that's really where we are for, for most patients right now, and there's now probably 50 different commercial companies that offer different gene panel tests. And these gene panel tests have a variety, you know, ranging from 20 to 500 genes that, that doctors have selected, and then they can screen for different mutations in those particular genes. This is much different than what we were doing, which is really a, a, a wider scale, more comprehensive, unbiased approach, 
whole genome sequencing involves the sequencing of each and every one of the 3.1 billion base pairs of DNA versus something like a gene panel test looking only at the D DNA of, of, of 20 or 30 or however many different genes. So the scale there is, is quite different. And as I alluded to, we do this um, because we're trying to identify anything that could be potentially driving the, the cancer. And, there, and we know now that there are many different types of alterations that occur in our genomes that can contribute to, to cancer. And as I said, each of these different platforms offers, uh, diff has different strengths and different weaknesses for doing that. Um, but really, we try to combine them when we can. Uh, to, to really uh, try to answer the question definitively. People are often interested, how long does this take? Um, under the best of circumstances, uh, from the time they drew the bone marrow biopsy until the time that the patient's getting the result, it takes about a month. Um, but we don't have the scale right now to, to, or the money uh, to, to be able to do that um, for every patient. Um, but, but um, we, we can, we're definitely on the upswing, and so we are scaling up. And all of these times are decreasing as our sequencing capacity uh, continues to increase. Just got brand new sequencing machines that can sequence about 20 whole genomes in under three days. So that's really remarkable. Those are what we call the $1,000 genomes. The cost is about $1,000 per genome. So that's a, a remarkable advancement. With those 10 machines, we can sequence about 18,000 genomes per year. So that's really uh, 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 phenomenal from where we were just a, a few years ago. It cost us about a million dollars to sequence the first cancer genome when we did that in 2000, 2008. So um, we've definitely made a lot of progress, and I think that we'll continue to make progress. Maybe not so much uh, in terms of the sequencing platforms themselves and the cost of sequencing, because that's that's quite low right now, and I think not prohibitive. Uh, what is uh, more prohibitive is really trying to make sense of all of this data to be able to analyze it, because it's not a trivial task to, to try and make sense of 3.1 billion base pairs of DNA. And this is just a representation of, of kind of what our automated pipeline looks like to try and assemble uh, this data into something meaningful. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to really a, a genomic analyst uh, who has to piece this together and this uh, really incredibly complex puzzle and make sense of it and try to interpret it to us, the oncologists, so that we can use it to help patients. So that's really where the bottleneck exists right now. So getting back to my own story, this is my leukemia genome. Uh, this is what we call a circos plot on the outside of the plot are uh, in the colors represents each of my chromosomes. Um, chromosomes just contain uh, our DNA. And on the very outside, you, you can't see them, uh, the letters, and they don't matter. But those are specific mutations that we identified in my leukemia cells. And we used DNA from my skin as a normal control. So we knew that these mutations were acquired, that they were actually um, part of what was driving my leukemia and not, work, not um, just uh, mutations that I was born with, for example. And then on the very inside of the plot, uh, we, you can see uh, big deletions or alterations in the um, uh, copy number of uh, my chromosome. And, and some of these deletions are in affecting genes that we're uh, very familiar with in terms of ALL pathogenesis. And so uh, a lot of this made sense in terms of, of what we uh, knew about the disease at the time. Unfortunately for me, um, we identified these 50 mutations, but none of them were good targets for any type of FDA-approved therapy, nor were there really any good targets for even experimental therapy. So the results of my whole genome sequencing didn't really reveal much uh, in terms of therapeutic benefit. So I do want to stress this. While this, uh, these technologies have a tremendous promise, uh, they're by no means a home run, and, and we still have a lot of work to do in trying to figure out and understand what drives cancer. Luckily, uh, as I said, we did comprehensive genomics, and so we didn't just look at the DNA alterations. We also looked at changes in RNA, and that's where we found kind of our, our smoking gun 
and that's that one gene in particular was being wildly overexpressed in my leukemia cells. And this gene is called FLT3, and it's a gene that we're very familiar with um, because many patients with acute myeloid leukemia, and remember the lab that I worked in was studying AML, many patients, about 30% of patients with AML, harbor mutations in this gene that activate it. So it's been studied for a very, very long time. Um, but it, it, it's, it's been known that there, some patients with ALL have high expression of the gene, and some patients even have mutations in, in the gene in ALL. Um, but it's not something that doctors routinely look for or screen for in their patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But because of our work with AML, we've been trying to treat those patients with AML and FLT3 mutations with FLT3 inhibitors for a very long time. And again, here's another little uh, part of my story that, that really uh, represents just how lucky I was, is that there still hasn't been a successful trial uh, using a FLT3 inhibitor in patients with uh, AML and FLT3 mutations. So here's a case where we know the mutation, we know the disease, we've developed very potent inhibitors of FLT3, and yet they still don't work. Um, nonetheless, I didn't have any other options. We we're going to try a FLT3 in inhibitor and see if it worked for me. Um, obviously, uh, I was well aware of the data with the uh, AML and FLT3 inhibitors, so we weren't holding out a lot of hope that this was going to work. Um, but, it, well, you know, the, the only way I can really describe it is that it worked miraculously. So I started taking the drug on a Friday afternoon, I remember, and by Monday morning I was feeling better. And my oncologist told me I was crazy and that it was all in my head. And I had my blood drawn and my blood counts looked better. And I said, no, this, this drug is really working. And two weeks later, I had a bone marrow biopsy and it showed that I was in complete remission. And this is a, <laughs> and this is a complicated uh, graph. And, and uh, Tim Lay has continued to really study my leukemia genome in detail. But what it represents is that at the time I started taking Sutin, there was about 10% of cells in my bone marrow that were leukemic. And you can see the, the blue dots uh, are the two weeks after I, I uh, started taking Sutin. And you see there's, you know, dots kind of floating around. But what we think those dots floating around are just representing some of the air rates that are intrinsic to the sequencing when you start looking at the very, very deep coverage. Um, and so is, this represents really a very, very profound deep molecular remission. Um, so after this, um, I went on and had a second stem cell transplant because we were afraid that uh, the sutin alone didn't cure the leukemia, that there probably still were leukemic cells there that we weren't detecting and that we really needed the power of the stem cell transplant to, to keep the leukemia in remission given that uh, my, my prognosis otherwise uh, was, was really quite dire. Um, so over three years ago now, I had a second stem cell transplant. This one was from a matched unrelated donor someone on, uh, in Europe um, who I'm very th thankful to, but don't know who he is, um, uh, graciously and anonymously donated their marrow and they flew it over, and, or their stem cells, and they flew it over here and um, I've been in remission ever since. Um, but I've had multiple complications. I don't know, for those of you who can see me closely, you can see my eyes inflamed today. Um, have had problems with skin GVHD, problems with uh, chronic soreness in my mouth, muscle weakness, on and on and on and on. So it's been not an easy road. And so uh, what it points to is that we'd like to be able to avoid doing uh, these treatments like stem cell transplants that have a really a host of really serious complications and instead move towards targeted therapies um, that have much fewer toxicities and can cure and eradicate the disease. We're not there yet by any means, but that's the challenge that lies before us and what is, you know, gets me up every morning and, and I, think that, uh, I think we're really on the brink of. And what's interesting about my own case is that just uh, uh, last year, the group out of St. Jude uh, published a large series showing the patients uh, with a particular gene expression profile with ALL, especially young patients, don't do very well. And what they determined in those patients through sequencing is that many of those patients uh, harbored 
mutations in genes that were targetable um, with drugs that were very similar to the, to the drug that I took. And so for ALL at least, it looks like that this may mean something more to, to other patients and that many young adults with ALL could potentially benefit from uh, more comprehensive sequencing to try to identify uh, targets and, and, and improve their outcomes. So I just kind of want to briefly uh, summarize, um, you know, what is the path forward for, for clinical cancer sequencing? We have to identify what are the relevant alterations, and they're probably going to be different for each cancer. We're going to have to determine which method really is uh, the best at, at, at identifying them. And then obviously cost factors into this as well. And, and thankfully that has become uh, much less of an issue over the past few years. And then finally, cancer is a very complicated disease. And so uh, cancer sequencing um, you know, needs to, uh, and for those of us who do cancer sequencing, we re need to uh, recognize that. And so um, it's not, uh, we're not at the point yet outside of the clinical trial where it makes sense to do cancer sequencing on everyone because we'd be left with, with everyone with cancer because we'd be left with data that we don't understand. And so I'm not advocating that we use cancer sequencing to try to uh, treat patients outside of what the standard of care is. But as, as reflected in my own case, I'd gone through all of the standard of care options. I had relapsed refractory disease. I had no, nowhere to turn. And so those are patients where I think this is appropriate uh, a modality that we can use today um, versus uh, starting to incorporate these types of studies and build them into the clinical trials that we're doing now so that in the future it kind of becomes standard of care. So that's, uh, that's where we stand. I run a genomics tumor board over at WashU. Each month we invite really anyone who sees a cancer care patient there uh, who they think would benefit from uh, further sequencing to present that patient anonymously uh, to a panel of oncologists, pathologists, and genomicists. We then discuss as a group whether or not the case would warrant further sequencing. Um, and I thought that I had included a, a few summary cases, but so far we've sequenced about 12 different cases. Many of those cases um, uh, ha haven't been clinically oriented per se, but are trying to answer kind of a basic uh, question about the biology of the disease. The disease. And so um, it's an active endeavor, um, and we're hoping to expand that and really to try to uh, push it more into the, the clinical realm uh, in the next year. So with that, I think I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for um, being here today and sharing your personal story. I have a question, because <laughs> I get asked this a lot. Um, what is, can you explain in simple terms the difference between RNA and DNA? Uh, I don't know about simple terms, but um, <laughs> the, um, you know, I, I once had a good uh, analogy for this, um, which of course now that I'm on the spot, I'm, I'm forgetting. <laughs> Um, but um, DNA is essentially the code, and the code needs to be translated into a protein. And so in order for that to happen, um, that code essentially just gets replicated into a very similar molecule as DNA that's RNA, and the RNA is actually what guides the production of the protein. So all it is is just an intermediate intermediary step, almost uh, identical chemical structure to DNA um, that's exported and that uh, the machinery in the cell can then recognize and read and turn into proteins. Thank you. That comes up a lot. <laughs> so. People want to know the difference between that. And I think, do we have a question? Thank you. Um, for your second stem cell transplant, why were your uh, brother cells not used. 
Yeah, so um, once a patient's uh, relapsed after a stem cell transplant, the, the chance of using those same cells to, to salvage them is low. And actually, I, I, I didn't mention, but after I did relapse, I did get another infusion of my brother's T cells um, to try and fight the leukemia, and it didn't work either. Um, so we try, the reason why we do stem cell transplants, there's two reasons. One is that we can deliver high doses of chemotherapy that we wouldn't otherwise be able to, to give. And the second is that there's also a graft versus leukemia effect. So it's actually the donor cells recognize the leukemia cells as foreign and attack them. And so to try and maximize that effect, we use a different donor. Um, is it true that some vaccines contain carcinogens? Do some vaccines contain carcinogens? Mm -hmm. Not to my knowledge. Okay. There, you know, vaccines. Um, some vaccines contain trace amounts of mercury, but they've, I think, taken out mercury from almost all vaccines now. So. Um, do you try CIRT cell therapy? So that's a good question, and that's a really exciting, uh, promising area in terms of treating ALL in particular. And so what this is, and it's been on the news, um, and they're called CAR T cells, pioneered by a group at um, the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. And these are genetically engineered T cells, and so what, what the process involves is, is removing T cells from the patient. Uh, infecting them with a, a virus. Oftentimes the virus is, is uh, the backbone virus of HIV. So you may have heard that in the news. It's essentially uh, a virus that's stripped of all the HIV parts but still can infect uh, T cells. And inside that virus we pop in a re-engineered receptor that recognizes the leukemia cells. Um, and so it, it forms a connector between these T cells, which can kill uh, a cell, and the leukemic cells. And so it's kind of a, a really neat mechanism to, to try and specifically target uh, those cancer cells. And there's, it's going to be, uh, because of the success um, with these CAR T cells, it's going to be um, a really interesting um, time to, to, to watch this because it's going to probably uh, have remarkable success not only in ALL, but we'll be able to re-engineer T cell receptors to fight other cancers as well. So we're just opening our, the first um, CAR T cell trial at WashU. Um, I just got my training for it, so um, that should open in the next few months for patients with um, B cell malignancies. At the time when I relapsed, um, this was three years ago, Carl June is a, a good friend of my oncologist who runs uh, the division of oncology at, at WashU. And we knew about this therapy. He had treated two patients with a, a chronic type of leukemia at the time and had treated one uh, young girl with ALL at the time. And she nearly died um, after she received the CAR T cell infusion because of the complications associated with, with uh, this kind of T cell flare up. She's fine, she's alive and doing well as of like two weeks ago. Um, when I saw a picture of her, you know, running around um, completely healthy and happy. So, but at the time it was very experimental and we knew that this patient uh, really had a tough time and she was young and healthy. And so we were worried that, that I wouldn't be able to make it through that. And I would have had gone to uh, Pennsylvania, but uh, we, we thought about it. Um, and, you know, I probably would have uh, considered it or tried to do it uh, had we not found this, this uh, uh, FLT3 expression. And our final question is, what does it mean if you have a cancer gene? So there's, um, we've identified uh, mutations that people carry in their families that predispose them to cancer. And the most famous one are BRCA1 and, and BRCA2. And that's the one that we've heard about recently because of Angelina Jolie. And for those um, patients who harbor mutations in, in those genes, they're born with them, they're inherited, they pass down from 
uh, mother to, to daughter, mother to son, um, and they, they increase your risk of breast and ovarian cancer and also slightly increase your risk for a few other cancers as well. They're not the only genes that, 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 um, uh, that, that cause increased susceptibility to cancer. So, and we're finding more each and every day. Right now, there's typically about 26 or so uh, different genes that we know have a, a very strikingly high um, uh, predis predisposition to cancer. And so there are many gene panel tests now that include all of those genes. So you can be screened if you uh, fit into one of those groups where if your family has an incidence of colon cancer, there's a group of genes that we know uh, predispose those patients um, and so on. So um, if, if people are worried about that, then they should speak to their doctor who can do a thorough family history and then refer them to a genetic counselor. Uh, if appropriate, and who can then uh, order that type of screening test. Dr. Wartman, thank you so much, and thank you for sharing your story. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, our third session is uh, Viruses Treating Cancer. And our first speaker is Dr. Carolyn Henry. She's a full professor of oncology at the University of Missouri with dual appointments in the College of Veterinary Medicine and the School of Medicine. She serves as the Associate Director of Research at the Ellis Fischel Cancer Center. Dr. Henry. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me here today. <clears throat> David Curiel and I are going to kind of tag team on this. So I'm going to do the non sciencey stuff, and he's going to do the sciencey stuff. But I wanted to kind of give a background about why we would consider using companion animals in some of this research that's being done. And I usually start out with this slide, because I think it's, it's a good reminder to us that it doesn't matter what species we're treating, we're fighting cancer and it's the same disease regardless of species. And so um, I think it's important that we work together to find answers more efficiently. And I come to this as a veterinary oncologist. So one of my patients is there on a leash, looks a little bit different than Dr. Curiel's patients, but we also have a human cancer center on our campus. We have a research reactor. We have a lot of resources that if we pool them together, we can do a, a great job in making advances in cancer research. But I'm going to say from the start, I think we've been doing things wrong for a long time. So. The traditional first step in research and development as we're trying to get new treatments to the clinic has been using mouse models. And while mouse models are important, I think there are some inherent problems with them and that may affect how likely these drugs are to make it to the market. So why are mice used? Well, mice are used because they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, we can get results in a short period of time and it's a relatively quick route to getting answers about new therapies. But I'm going to submit to you that the shortest route may not always be the best route. And there are lots of variations of this slide that have, have shown up in, in presentations and in manuscripts. But the take home message from this, this is a timeline of how long it takes from first development of a drug to using it in the clinic and how many of those drugs fail. So if you remember one point from this slide, it's that for every five to 10,000 new compounds that are tested, one gets FDA approval. And if you look at the bottom of this graph, the more disturbing thing to me is the number of years that are taken into account while that happens. So those are years when patients need to be getting therapy and we're not getting those answers fast enough in my opinion. And it's not just my opinion. This is an article that goes back to 2004 called Why We're Losing the War on Cancer and How to Win It. And in this paper, Dr. Weinberg, who's a, a famous oncologist on the human side, said, and again, this is, this is over 10 years ago, a fundamental problem which remains to be solved in the whole cancer research effort in terms of therapies is that the preclinical models of human cancer in a large part stink. That's pretty clear. Um, so what have we done to address that problem in the past decade? Well, we're still using mice. Um, and again, I, I'm not here to say there's not a role for, for mice in this research, but I think we need to look at other models as well. 
And the reasons are there's some inherent problems with rodent models. So as a, as a cancer researcher, as I look at what we can and can't answer in rodents, the first thing you need to understand is if we're going to create cancer in a mouse model, that mouse has to be immunoincompetent. We have to affect their immune system and make it abnormal. So we're starting out with a model that is not normal, is not what we would be seeing in the clinic. Um, we see differences in side effects. So for example, a lot of people don't know, but mice don't vomit. So that's be a pretty hard side effect to try to discover in a mouse because they can't do that. Um, we're also not studying the natural course of disease. So we are artificially creating cancer in a model and then trying to make um, relevant uh, findings from that moving into the clinic, and that doesn't always happen. They have a relatively rapid disease progression. So if we want to look at effects on minimal disease, that's hard to do because it replicates very quickly and their, their lifespan is so short. And then there's also just some biosampling limitations. It's difficult to get large samples from a very small animal such as a mouse. So is it time that we change our tune? And I think that, that we still need to maintain the mouse model, but I do think we need to think about other players. And these are the players that I work with. So domesticated cats and dogs, our pets, companion animals, can make very good models of cancer. So let's talk about what kind of numbers we have to work with. If we're talking about clinical trials, are there enough pets that we can do this? Well, there are approximately 40% of us in the U.S. that own at least one dog, and about 25% of us own two. And that makes up for over 77 million dogs just in the U.S. And that's probably because dogs are man's best friend. Now, if we look at cats, there's a bit fewer cats. There are a little over 74 million cats. And I'll spare you my opinion about some cats. I actually have had cats. But, um, and if you look at total veterinary clinic visits, they're actually going up in dogs. You had over 130 million dog visits um, in 2011 and uh, about 60 million in cats. Okay, so my next question, by show of hands, how many of these cancers do you think dogs and cats get? Actually, show of fingers. I see a few raising their paws because it's all of them. Yes, very good. So literally all of the cancers that are shown here, which are the top occurring cancers in people, occur in dogs and cats. And in fact, cancer is a leading cause of death in dogs. So about one in four dogs will develop cancer in their lifetime. And for those that live beyond 10 years of age, about half of them will develop cancer. And some of that is probably most noted because we're doing a better job diagnosing it. And some of it may be that our owners are a bit more savvy. We've got internet resources now and they're, they're questioning why their old pet is having these problems. And so we're probably diagnosing it more in, in addition to having it occur more often. And just to give you an idea of the numbers, if we look at something like uh, lymphoma leukemia, you can see that the incidence in dogs and people is about the same. It's way up there in cats. Why would that be? Anybody know? Feline leukemia virus. Okay, so there sometimes are differences in species that will cause them to have a much higher rate of certain cancers. Uh, another obvious example of that is lung cancer. You see that the numbers for lung cancer are much higher in people than they are in dogs. Most of my patients do not smoke. <laughs> and then if you look at something like bone cancer, it's a relatively rare disease in people, but it occurs in teenage kids. And if that's your kid, you don't care that it's rare, you want to find an answer. Well, we see that disease eight times as often in dogs as we do in people. So that's a very good way for us to take advantage of that to try to find answers that will also help veterinary patients. So overall, if you just look at how common cancer is, we actually see more cancer in dogs than what is seen that's diagnosed in people, and a little bit less in cats. So, is it time that we consider using these models and maybe change who we're collaborating with or adding additional partners? Well, I would say yes. Um, when people come to me and say, it, it cracks me up, I'll have an interview and they'll say, we want to come to your laboratory. And I really want to get beakers and flasks and put colored fluids in them because I think that's what people expect. Um, this is my laboratory. So, what I do is, is 
run clinical trials using companion animals that have cancer. And why is that useful? Well, first of all, if you think about how we live with our pets, they're sharing our environment. So if there are things in the environment that can cause cancer, they're being exposed to them at the same time. Another point that needs to be clarified is what standard of care is. So you've heard people this morning talk about standard of care. There aren't always standard of care therapies in veterinary medicine. That gives us a little more ability to think outside the box and try new therapies versus in a human situation where we have to be concerned about what will be covered by insurance, for example. Um, the anatomical size and structure is very similar, so we can use the same sort of imaging, we can get the same side, sort of samples that we can in people, and we can assess long-term outcome. So it's possible to remove a tumor that we know is likely to spread elsewhere and then watch that patient for their lifetime to see if it comes back. That's not how we're doing things in rodent models, typically. So why else are they useful? Well, there are certain factors we can control a bit better in our animal patients. For instance, their lifestyle choices. Um, we, we can have a curfew on them and we can control what they get out of the fridge usually. So we can control their diet. Um, we can control their hormone status. So we spay or neuter our pets most of the time in the U.S. How many guys in the audience would volunteer to be castrated so you could participate in a clinical trial? Raise your hands. <laughs> All right, so that's something we can do in our patients that is done anyway. And you would think we'd get rid of the placebo effect, um, where, where you imagine something's working just because you really want it to. Um, you can't completely eliminate that even in veterinary studies, because I'll tell you, if the owners want to believe it's working, they'll believe it's working. So that's still a factor, but not as big. And then as a pet owner, you don't want to hear, well, they have a shorter lifespan, because that's kind of sad for us. But in terms of running a clinical trial, it's very reasonable that you could do a full, large clinical trial in a span of a decade. And more likely, for getting shorter term answers, we can, we can get those done in more like five years or less. So that's, as opposed to a lifetime study in people, that's remarkable. And then I think the most important thing is that they are actually having spontaneously arising tumors. So we're not creating cancer in these animals. They're coming to be treated because they have developed cancer just like you or I could. So the dog on the left with the big lymph nodes, that's lymphoma, just like we see in people. The, the uh, radiograph in the center, that's a dog that has a large lung tumor. And then this one on the right is a dog that had melanoma in its mouth and that acts very much like human skin melanoma. And so we decided to do an abdominal ultrasound to make sure that it hadn't spread to the internal organs. And once we clipped the hair off the belly, we really didn't need to go any further than that because you can see there's obvious widespread metastasis, just like we would see in a human patient. And then we also have advanced imaging capabilities that are identical to what's available in human medicine. So um, upper left-hand corner, that's a, a bone scan. A dog came in with a lesion on its leg. And let me get that. this is the osteosarcoma on the, on the leg. But what we found by doing the bone scan is it also had a lesion on its ribs that we would not have known about had we not done the scan. Um, we have CT, we have MRI, this is an MRI of a brain tumor in a cat, and we have standard radiographs just like the human hospital. And in fact, we uh, participated in the Biomed Valley study that was talked about, and we used our PET imaging to show the hypoxic areas within the tumor quite nicely. So hopefully I've convinced you that they look similar, but how do we know they're actually the same thing? Well, genetics. So we now know about the genetics of the canine. We know about feline genomics and genetics. And we can determine if there is a genetic defect that occurs in a human cancer, is that same mutation or defect present in the, in the animal disease. And what's even cooler, if you think about it, is we have very good pedigree information on a lot of dogs. So if you discover that a certain breed tends to have a certain cancer, whereas another breed does not, what can you do? Well, you can compare the genome between the two and say, okay, what's different? What does this dog have that this one doesn't have that might make it predisposed to this particular cancer? Again, very, very difficult type of study to do in people um, because of outbreeding, which is usually the point where I say I'm from Kentucky and make some inbreeding joke, but I'll pass since tomorrow's Derby Day. 
So breed associations with cancer are quite interesting to me. I, for instance, work on bladder cancer, and Scottish Terriers are notorious for getting bladder cancer. Well, why is that? And can we study that breed specifically to learn more about it? This is also the slide where you find your personal pet and get worried and ask me questions later. So, <laughs> All right, we also have very uh, um, simplified approval process. So we don't have the third party payers very often. We don't have a lot of HMOs involved in our patients. And HIPAA rules do apply to our patients, um, but it's, it's a little bit simplified. And then something else that's very important that not everyone thinks about is the fact that we can do repeat biosampling. Well, what that means is I can do a biopsy um, on a patient, one of my patients, and then come back the next day and biopsy it again if I want to look at something like tumor targeting. That would be very difficult to get through the IRB at a human facility. And the other thing is a lot more pet owners will consent to a necropsy or an autopsy. That's critically important to understand if there's any occult side effects of drugs or occult disease that we didn't pick up. <clears throat> and this is an example of a trial that we ran through the NCI um, where we basically just needed to show that tumor tissue was targeted and normal tissue was not. So the way we were able to do that is we took tumor tissue um, and, and looked at it before treatment and then we looked at it after treatment, and we looked at normal tissue before and after treatment and showed that it didn't go to the normal tissue. So that involved two biopsies, two days. What did the pet owner get out of it? What did the dog get out of it? Got compensation that then went towards treating that dog as a dog that otherwise probably would not have been treated. What's interesting is I was actually given a talk like this in, in France, and the human oncologist that, is, that was running this trial was showing our data, um, and it has now moved into clinical trials. So exciting stuff when you can see that happen in the course of less than a decade. Uh, we also do radiation therapy in our patients. So in Wentzville, we have a clinic, and we have one in Columbia where we can do radiation therapy just as can be done in people. So we often talk about having a bench to bedside approach and where I think that's important, uh, or whereas I think that's important, I think also if we can put the veterinarian in there and develop a bench to cage side to bedside approach, we may be able to get additional information that may help tighten up that timeline that I showed you for the FDA approvals. Um, I'm not the only one that thinks this. There's actually a group through the National Cancer Institute that is a oncology trials consortium made up of veterinary institutions that have oncologists and the particular uh, infrastructure needed. And there's also a biospecimen repository that was developed. So we have samples of dog tumors, um, blood, all, all different samples, 13 different samples from each patient um, banked so that if researchers need that, they can have access to it. So we get access to patients. We can actually guide the translation of some of these results as they move into human clinical trials. And it was, it was gratifying to be sitting in the back and first hear the Biomed Valley um, talk where we're involved in that. And then tumor goggles were involved in that. And it's just really nice to know that we've got folks in St. Louis, folks in Kansas City, and a vet school in between that's working with both of them. And I think that's exactly what we need to do is, is create more of those partnerships. These are the members of the Comparative Oncology Trials Consortium. Um, they actually, I, I used this slide at the NIH two weeks ago, and, and they were very embarrassed because I pointed out that I had just given this talk in Auburn, and I noticed that they were AL and so was Arkansas. <laughs> and this, is, this was off the NCI website. And, uh, but I, I told Alabama they were special because they had a star, but actually they're special because they they're part of this consortium. And, uh, my husband, who's from Kansas, was a little upset with that one, too, but we got that fixed. So. so this has resulted in actual moving forward into trials. This is the one I showed you where we did the repeat biopsy samples. So really what we needed to show is you could target tumor tissue, and we were able to do that, and this resulted not just in a publication, but moving this forward into human clinical trials. So does it work? Well, we're from Show Me State, and so we always sort of take the approach of show me this works um, and give me some examples of where this translation has actually happened. And probably the best example I can give you is a, a drug that was developed at the MU Research Reactor called Samarium. Um, it's a tumor-seeking or bone tumor-seeking compound, 
and it was moved into human clinical trials after it showed promise in dogs with bone cancer. Um, this is now on the market, has been on the market since the 90s, under the name Quadramet, is used to treat metastatic to bone cancer from things like prostate cancer, breast cancer, bladder cancer. So, clear example of where it has made that transition into the human clinical trials. And then David's going to be talking about vaccines, so I didn't want to steal too much of his thunder, but there's actually an approved drug to treat dog melanoma that is a tumor vaccine. A little bit different than, than what we're, we're working on right now, but has full uh, USDA approval for use in dogs. So I would say this is a win-win situation. It helps us not only with the research, but also with funding. Um, funding is going down, as someone alluded to, in all states um, from a, a national resources. But if we work together, um, those of us in veterinary medicine oftentimes have access to other sources such as foundations and breed groups. So we can combine our resources and get answers about the same tumor types, but through different studies. So the next step is we're looking at vaccine therapies for tumor types that we see in dogs that are good models for people. And I've listed the, the most common ones that we're looking at right here, bone cancer, prostate cancer. Dogs the only good model of spontaneously occurring prostate cancer um, in animals. And melanoma, lymphoma, and brain tumors are all that are being looked at in clinical trials right now. So I think it's kind of a big deal. And, um, Fortunately, the word is spreading, and we're actually having a meeting um, now, it's May 1st, so next month, um, with the Institute of Medicine, which has now become the Academy of Medicine, um, that's specifically looking at the role of clinical studies in pets with naturally occurring cancer in translational cancer research. So this isn't just us making it up. This is the, the, uh, the strategy folks in D.C. and those that are controlling the funds looking at this and saying, is there a more efficient way to do the research and, and do pet animals have a role in this? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. And I just want to thank Missouri Cures for all the support that you guys have given us through the, through the years and for the opportunity to educate people about some new topics. So appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Henry. I uh, just want to introduce Dr. David Curiel. He's the Director of Cancer Biology in the Biologic Therapeutic Center at Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. Curiel? This, this has a pointer. Yeah, so that'll be forward, backwards, and that's your laser pointer. Forward, backward, okay. I'm getting you up here real quick. And you should be good to go. Perfect. I also wanted to thank Dina Ladd and Missouri Curious for putting on this event. And um, my talk will be the more sciencey talk, but I do want to spread the religion of animal models. It is interesting that our first two speakers used canine subjects, and my experience has been exactly what Carolyn highlighted. This can dramatically shorten the time to translation. And I think Carolyn might have understated it. 99.9% .9 of NCI dollars for animals for, are for mice, 99.9. .9. And that shows the degree to which we've invested in a kind of model and, and certainly asks us to revisit, are there better models? So I'm going to be talking about virus-based therapies for canine and human cancer. So as background, survival benefit has been demonstrated with tumor vaccines for canine melanoma. And this was the drug that Carolyn just highlighted, Oncocept, which is being used for the common canine tumor melanoma. It's important to note as we talk about treating tumors in humans with vaccines, that this is the only approved tumor vaccine in any animal species. Even though this has come to market, there are some limits with this agent. <laughs> and so we wondered if we could use the canine melanoma context as a starting point to show how we could improve cancer vaccines for dogs and develop cancer vaccines for patients. As background, this is the sciencey part, we vaccinate against tumors by delivering the tumor antigens. And we do this by vaccinating and delivering these genes to a key immunoregulatory cell 
that we call the dendritic cell. This cell is critical to stimulating an immune response. And traditionally, this has been done with viral vectors that deliver genes and load them so the dendritic cell can stimulate an anti-tumor immune response. This is a little advertising, a dendritic cell from my brother Tyler's laboratory at UT in uh, Austin. And the way this is done practically in humans, and there are hundreds of trials ongoing now using this approach, is the dendritic cells are removed from the body, they're modified extracorporeally, that is they're transduced with these vectors, and then after being maintained, they're delivered back to the body. Obviously, this is an expensive and a laborious process, and it may even be that this is deleterious to the dendritic cell's immune function. So at least conceptually, if you had the means to deliver the genes right to the intact individual, and a vector that could deliver those genes right to the dendritic cell, you could accomplish the same goal of active immunization. As I've mentioned, the majority of the hundreds of human trials heretofore have used this extracorporeally approach. Cells are removed from the body, expanded, modified, maintained outside the body, and then reimplanted. And not only is this expensive and laborious, but in fact, this may be deleterious to the stimulation you're seeking to uh, accomplish. So, this approach of direct in vivo modification offers a lot of advantages. It's less labor intensive, it's logistically attractive as an off the shelf. You're using lower doses to deliver the genes, so you may have less cytopathic effects. And this, in fact, may exploit the physiologic functions of the dendritic cell, yielding an improved vaccine outcome. Well, the predicates of efficacy, when you do one of these trials, is the degree to which you can give your vaccine in the skin, that your gene delivery agent, what we call the vector, can find the dendritic cell. To this point, there have been a limited repertoire of vectors capable of being administered and finding the dendritic cells in vivo. So clearly, we need new vectors to realize the, the potential of this genetic immunotherapy. And this is largely what my lab does. I call that vectorology, the science of creating new vectors. One candidate vector that we've sought to adapt for this purpose is adenovirus. I'm showing you an electron micrograph here. And we use this because it has all of these advantages. It's stable, it's well characterized, we can modify it readily. But most importantly, this agent has been used in basic biology studies for decades. We know a good deal about it, and that's a useful starting point to modify it for our purposes. What we do know is its entry pathway, and I'm showing you this here. This is a naked capsid virus with an isocahedral coat, and it binds to a primary receptor on cells that we call CAR by these long antennae-like projections. After anchoring, the virus triggers internalization and then delivery of its gene for immunostimulation. So th the problem with these vectors as they stand are many of the cells that we would want to deliver genes to, including dendritic cells, lack CAR. In addition, the virus could be sequestered in the liver. So, so what we need to do, in simple terms, is modify the tropism of the virus, alter the way that it binds, so it no longer sees CAR or is directed to it, and can see a target molecule on your key cell, in this case, the dendritic cell. So historically, and over the last 20 years, my lab and others have used a wide variety of methods to retarget the virus. That is to cross-link it to a new receptor and away from CAR. And again, these are historical examples that show that we can do it. So for dendritic cells, the molecule CD40 is overexpressed on these cells and this is linked to immune activation of the dendritic cells, so it was logical to route our vaccine to this dendritic cell target. So a graduate student in my laboratory, Brian Tillman, 
used one of these adapters and he used adenovirus that's been used in hundreds of human trials or he retargeted it to CD40 and he transduced human dendritic cells. This is a logarithmic scale and you can see that we augmented gene transfer three orders of magnitude. That's a thousand to ten thousand fold improvements in gene transfer. So that sounds great, but if you went to the FDA, they'd say, we don't like that two component system. It's unwieldy, it's expensive, you're going to need approvals for both pieces. So these considerations suggested that we accomplish the same technical goal, but with a single unit system. So, so not only these adapter systems, but in fact, genetically modifying the capsid is another way to change the tropism. And again, a diversity of techniques have been used, placing ligands in the capsid, placing ligands in loops on the capsid, or combinations of these. So with this in mind, we set about to modify the tropism of the adenovirus to route it to CD40 to improve vaccine immunotherapy. And we sought to modify the major capsid protein fiber, the one that dictates tropism. So as we're targeting CD40, we use the native ligand for CD40, CD40L, a molecule that normally would see that. And we engineered a virus that now lacks normal fiber, but just has the CD40L in the capsid. So again, uh, dendritic cells from my brother's lab, logarithmic scale. This is the virus that's been used in thousands of human trials in hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, hundreds of trials. And this is our CD40 targeted virus. And again, you can see we dramatically enhance efficiency, three and four orders of magnitude improvements by virtue of our viral engineering. So I didn't need to be convinced of the fact that the mouse as a model stunk and it particularly stunk for melanoma. So that led us to do a collaborative trial where we simply sought to ask the question, if we deliver a tumor antigen, in this case CEA, which is a marker of colon, human colon cancer, with the normal ad that's used in human trials, or our ad, was there an immunological gain? Does targeting accrue vaccine advantage? And you can see when we looked at the antibodies to the tumor antigen, in five dog subjects, there were dramatic enhancements. So a stringent model challenged with a vaccine and a tumor antigen clearly shows the gains that accrue our vector engineering. Well, we could have run right to the dogs to do the trial and we're planning on that, but then some interesting new concepts arose and it turns out that it, at WashU and other centers, it turns out that these dendritic cells are not just a single population, but in fact they're heterogeneous. And there are subsets of DCs that are even more potent than the bulk DCs that we harvest. And the problem is that we'd now actually like to have a dendritic cell subset vaccine to make it even better. And we therefore have the technical problem of how do we target these brand new subsets that are just being targeted in the labs of people like Tom Murphy and Will Galanders at Wash U. Well, we, we knew we had to incorporate antibodies into the virus, and we knew that people had failed for 20 years to incorporate human and mouse antibodies to the virus, so we went again to our animal menagerie, and it turned out that camels, for reasons that perhaps only God knew, had a unique structure of antibodies. Unlike complicated human antibodies, they were actually small, single domain, and exceptionally stable, properties useful for our vector engineering. So Sergei Kalibrilov and Igor Dmitriev in my lab then sought to develop a virus that could see dendritic cell subsets for even a more potent vaccine. So we immunized llamas with these dendritic cell subsets to derive these camel antibodies that now saw distinct subpopulations of DCs, and we rescued this virus. So again, we're, we're showing you a research enterprise that has now embodied three distinct schools of veterinary medicine.
to get where we want to go. And in our preliminary studies with DCs, we compared ad 5 with a green fluorescent reporter. And again, this has been used in hundreds of patients. This is our camelid antibody retargeted ad. And you can see we dramatically enhance gene delivery to DCs. But on, not only that, these are the most potent subset of DCs that we think will predicate an even more potent vaccine effect. So, so this, this new camelid antibody retargeting should offer exciting new possibilities for vector targeting. And we can link it directly to this goal of targeting DC subsets for what we hope will be an even more potent vaccine. We're showing you that we can improve vaccines with targeting, that engineering the vector for DC subset targeting may give us further improvements, and we're actively pursuing the goal of doing a trial in dogs with melanoma now to show in the most stringent manner possible the gains that accrue this vector in engineering. And as Carolyn said, we think this is the shortest path to the FDA to get approval for a follow-on human trial. So, so I'd like to thank my many collaborators. Again, this was the science part of the talk uh, at the Cancer Biology Division at WashU, the collaborators at the Free University of Amsterdam, the Immunobiology Group, uh, Victor Krasnick at MD Anderson, uh, Bruce Smith at the Veterinary College of uh, Auburn, and Carolyn Henry and her group at the Veterinary Medicine College at Mizzou. Thanks. Henry, Dr. Curiel, thank you. That was wonderful. Can you, I mean, I know you all have known each other for a long time. Can you just talk a little bit about, I think your history is interesting. Can you talk about how you all have worked together in Alabama? And I think it gives a nice history. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Well, we actually didn't know each other in Alabama, but as you can tell from our accents, no, you don't have one, do you? <laughs> Um, I actually went to Auburn University for vet school, and I did my um, oncology residency there. Um, David had been working with Bruce Smith at Auburn, and um, we actually had our Veterinary Cancer Society meeting at a place called Callaway Gardens, which is um, outside Columbus, Georgia, in that area, and invited Dr. Curiel to speak there. So I believe that's where we first met, was at a Veterinary Cancer Society meeting. And when he moved to St. Louis, he kind of cold called me and said, what are you guys doing in veterinary oncology? And it, that sparked a long conversation that hopefully will lead to a long history of uh, successful clinical trials. Yeah, I can't overstate the, the, the counterintuitive piece for investigators because we need to do experiments in a hurry. We need to write grants and we need to push the translational envelope. But sometimes the question that we need answered isn't answered rigorously in a mouse. So in this study that um, Carolyn mentions with Bruce, because human viruses didn't replicate in mice, we couldn't predict what a whole new class of replicating viruses would do in terms of toxicity in humans, virotherapy agents. So we had to go back to the beginning and build a dog version of the virus, put it in dogs, and do a trial but that gave us data that fully anticipated the human situation. Cost more, took longer, but it was better data, and the FDA, to your surprise, and the NCI will actually underwrite better studies if they give you more useful information. Um, so Dr. Henry, how do you know that your animal, your cat, your dog, has cancer, and then what can you expect after that diagnosis? You're worried because of that slide, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I mean, that's, that's a good question. That's part of the issue with veterinary oncology is oftentimes we don't know. So it's not until they have overt clinical signs that we pick up on it, and so oftentimes it's spread to other sites and is more aggressive. Um, it's really the same list of things that you see for people to look for. So, you know, any new lump bump, any change in appetite, activity level. Um, and, and basically, most of the cancers we see are going to occur in the older population, but there are a few, such as lymphoma, 
and some of the oral tumors that will occur in, in younger animals. So, um, you know, I, not just because I'm a veterinarian, but I'm going to say you should have them uh, looked at once a year at least for an annual exam. Um, but then if something doesn't seem right, don't be shy about checking into it. Um, and the other thing I'll say is if your pet has a mass and your veterinarian says, well, let's just watch it and see what happens, get a second opinion because uh, the majority of what we see at the university hospital as a tertiary referral are things that have been watched and guess what, they got bigger. So um, if you feel it's important, we feel it's important and should be taken care of immediately. And there's pet insurance, such a thing? There is pet insurance. It's not widely uh, used in, in this area, at least. I think on the coasts we see a bit more of it. Um, but there are some pet insurance policies that are getting quite a bit better. When they first came out, oftentimes they wouldn't cover pets that were older than 10 years of age. They wouldn't cover pets that had cancer. Um, and, and so that has improved. I just want to key off a point Carolyn made as well to kind of encourage investigators to use these models. Um, veterinarians have to propose the use of dogs or companion animals to the NIH. They have to compete with us and they have to make the case that the end point is not treating dogs, that the model answers the human relevant question. But then when they turn around and write to dog foundations, they have to make the case that this isn't a model about humans, this is to treat dogs. And somehow it's not really that they're stuck in the middle, it actually provides two ways forward. So as an academic medical human investigator, I've actually gotten funded through a number of these dog foundations and Carolyn's gotten funded through the NIH, so somehow it all works <laughs> if you make your case correctly. Well, that kind of leads into this question. Um, what efforts are being made to lobby for funding um, to be converted from mice to companion animals in research? Well, in fact, um, I was just at a conference at the NIH where we talked about this very topic, and. Um, there's been some, some reorganization with the, in the NIH, and they now have a, uh, an institute that is specifically on clinical and translational science. So um, veterinary oncologists are lobbying. We're trying to get our voices heard in D.C., and the workshop I mentioned is being supported by at least six different um, vet schools, and it's being um, hosted by uh, an individual from Duke University that works at their cancer center. So. You know, I think the first step is getting folks like David and I working together so we're aware of what can be done and then showing those success stories to the people that can change policy. Car Carolyn and I were just in Chicago and we were being interviewed by Rebecca Skloot. She wrote The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, but her real passion is the kind of work we do with animal models. And um, she asked us the same question, what's missing? And, and really, when you endeavor into the animal work, you often find that the, the tools are lacking. You can see a model's useful. You want, might want to study immunobiology, but it's not like with mice, where there are the antibodies and the reagents. You often have to make your tools while you're answering the primary question. So, so the problem is so great in terms of the, the need for more fundamental work to make more tools so that these models can truly be used to best advantage. Um, is it fair to say that current virus-related cancer therapy is to find new things to enhance T cells to attack cancer? Um, that's a good question. Well, the, the important thing that is that these viral therapies are not Star Wars, but one's already been licensed as an over-the-counter drug in the Netherlands. and. One in this country, an ambit gen reagent, has just gone this week with phase three results to the FDA. So we anticipate that will be a drug within a month. So these are online drugs that will soon be you know, available to patients. Um, interestingly, virotherapy has now been linked to immunostimulation, and it may be that some of the beneficial effects are vaccine effects, as the questioner implies. Dr. Curiel, Dr. Henry, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I think that you all might be sticking around a little bit after the symposium if anyone has additional questions. And I want to thank everyone for coming today to the symposium. And I think we have most of your emails now, so you'll be on our list. And uh, re you'll receive invitations to our, our future events. So thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you.